Good evening, everyone. And we have a special guest, Reza Mehta, which is a very important topic to provide here. It will be a pleasure. Uh, I just uh, want to introduce Reza Mehta very shortly. I'll give the microphone to Reza. Reza is currently his thesis at Georgetown University. Uh, he has two master degrees. The first one is from Italy. And the second one is from uh, Albany, from the Italian University. And uh, he is a prolific writer. He has three books in Albanian and in articles. And so, that's it. Can you this one? This is one? Is it one? Yes. I mean, sorry. I have always problems with the microphones. So, uh, thank you very much, Milan, for the invitation of so uh, I think the amount of vegetable stuff we are discussing is starting to begin with. Normally in the in the popular Western imagination, Saudi Arabia is often perceived as a traditionalist and religious society dominated by ultra conservative and fundamentalist religious class, who is averse to any form of change or progress. As scholars have uh, countered this misconception and have highlighted the magnificity of the South religious field by bringing as a concrete example the reformist movement of the South of Sahara, right? And, and its proposal of establishing a fickle one here, jurisprudence of reality or reality based jurisprudence, as a conceptual framework to restore the relevance of Sharia in the modern times. Today, I will try to trace the intra Salafi debates on fit and water, and unravel the various discursive strategies used by the non Sahri Salafi scholars to problematize the Sahri conceptualization of the water, the reality, and to take its revolutionary elements by bringing them in line with the dominant Salafi religious methodologies. It is by contention that the debates on fit and water that happened in Saudi the 80s and 90s, especially, were enabled and rendered intelligible. In the first place, by the modern condition, the new subjectivities, and the novel social configuration created by the sound of Western style organization process. This process constitutes the field against which each actor involved in the debate tried to construct its position vis a 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 vis multifaceted and not only limited to materialist consideration or consideration of class and preserving power. Rather, in their analysis, Salafi scholars have often offered a more nuanced conceptualization of Peter Walker than the Sahis themselves. And what I want to say is that often the non Sahih Salafi scholars have actually offered a recent criticism. And people think that they are just terrorists who just have refused the Sahih understanding of the Waqiyah for political reasons or even for preservation of the status quo of the religious field in Saudi Arabia. Now, at this point, it's important to, make, to have a brief look on what the Sahri were, what were the contribution and how they emerged in the specific Saudi uh, context. So, uh, normally the, the Sahris were the, inter the intellectual predecessors of the Sahris were the most valuable scholars from the 50s and the 60s were welcome in the Southern Kingdom to contribute to the massive field of education and help the construction of the Islamic discourse as a common response to Nazis and Arabist socialism. Simultaneously with pan Islamic discourse, the Southern Kingdom promoted a modernization discourse based on the notion of Tanmir or Jazat, development and achievement, represented by various modernists and leftists. Saudi intellectuals who became the spokesman for spokesman for the kingdom of development and modernization. By the 70s, the Saudi modernists became the backbone of the new bureaucratic state machine and occupied the key administrative positions in the government as well as dominated the cultural sphere in Saudi Arabia. They constituted an entire new social field, that of the Mufatafim, the intellectuals, that was added to the already existing political and religious field. In the 70s, the social configuration of Saudi society was characterized by what Stefan Lacroix called the sectorization of social life. 
where all sectors of society, like the religious and political sectors, maintain a vertical relationship with the political authority and reduce to maximum any horizontal, intersectional interference or interaction. In this way, reformist mobilization within one sphere of society finds it difficult to spread to other social fields. The Sahis emerged in Saudi Arabia in the 80s, although it's not the Saudi Arabia, and they represent an amalgam of Wahhabi religious doctrine with a Muslim government of social political activism. Historically, historically they emerged, the emergence was enabled by the, social, by the economic crisis in the 70s, due to a drop in oil revenue, the Iran revolution on the 79th, and the rise of global islamism as, well, as well as the disruption and the rapid deterioration of the traditional Saudi social life caused by the modernization process. Its main advocates were young Saudi scholars and intellectuals who represented themselves as as Halakha Ilmiya, Islamia, Sunni, Salafi, Siyasi. So Sunni, Salafi, reformist, scientific, and political movement. And its most vocal representatives were young scholars like Salman Hawad, Salman Rauden, and Nasser Omar, two of which, of whom, are currently in prison. So they were called they were called the so-called ref uh, the, the, the reformist leadership. Right? So the Saudis, what, what what how did the Saudis situate themselves in the social political configuration of Saudi Arabia? So the Saudis were strongly opposed to the sectorization of social life, like I mentioned earlier, and identified the problem of the Saudi society in the predominance of the phenomenon of the job. Was partner. Now, uh, this is a theological concept, but the, in the particular Sahri context, it refers to the Saudi superiorist worldview that separated faith from the ultimate actions. For the Sahris, the Jam was the consequence of the modernist conspiracy to promote the separation of faith from the social political engagement and to establish in this way the habits of secularism and modernism. To this, Sahri uh, juxtaposed the principle of unity of sovereignty, of unity in which faith and ultimate works are conceived as intrinsically connected. Around the same time, the Sahris criticized the Wahhabi establishment for being oblivious to contemporary social political reality and for being preoccupied only with frivolous new legal details of purity, Baha'i, and worship in other. Their negligence of fitter welfare was seen by the Sahris as the main reason for the weakening of Ulama's role in society and the proliferation of secularist conspiracies against the front. Also, the traditional Ulama were criticized for Ayman Afikiria, for the so-called intellectual secularism, i.e. for unconsciously appropriating elements of Birja in their religious methodology, or for being just Ulama Nas and not Ulama Waka. In, in order to respond to the above mentioned perceived challenges, the Sahris engaged throughout the 80s and the 90s in an intensive public campaign against the Saudi modernists and in a low intensity war with the religious establishment. In a short period, they, they created their own intellectuals and put them out and dominated the Saudi public sphere. Sahwa constituted a multi sectorial mobilization that undermined the very essence of the social configuration of the Saudi society of that time by challenging liberals' monopoly over state affairs and that of the religious establishment over the religious domain. In the 90s, the Sahris uh, commuted with the political field, not only the intellectual and the religious one, by opposing the welcoming of the US troops to the Holy Land and by publicly proposing a series of political and economic reforms. The movement, the movement was cut down in 1994 where the leaders of the movement were imprisoned without form of charges in order to be liberated in 1998 under specific circumstances and conditions. And from 1998 onward, let's say that the, the Sahris is somehow the kind of approach to figure what was not anymore so dominant as a terminology in their proposals. However, that, that is another part of phase of the development. Now, uh, in 1992, Nasser Omar, one of the leaders of Sahwa, he publishes a treatise called Fitrawaka Mutawwana Ruba Ahmad Ruba Musawwana, 
So the risk depends on the value the foundation influences the sources. It was the, this is like a kind of manifest of the Sahri manifest of what fit and what means and what role it should play in, in reforming Islam or let's say in British Sharia relevance for the world condition. It has been published in 1992, which is the most intense moment of the Sahri collusion with almost every every social and political and religious group in Saudi Arabia. Now, the treatise itself is dedicated to the ulema, so it's something, it's something written for the ulema, specific for this social group. Uh, and also to uh, students of knowledge, and is an attempt to identify the plans that affected the religious field in Saudi Arabia and restore the relevance of Sharia for society, and is situated in the discourse of crisis. That's the situation in the text. In which the present condition of Muslim movement is presented as that of disruption, decline, backwardness, and powerlessness. This condition is attributed to the abandonment of the guidance of the Quran and Sunni to integrate fit and market in the religious discourse, and to the restriction of Sharia's application in society, as a consequence of the spread of poverty and the introduction of positive laws in Kenya. Within a conspirative framework, Nasser Omar presents Saudi society as victim of secularist plot to undermine the religious foundation of the society and to establish the heresy of government. Only the integration of fiscal work in the religious discourse is presented as capable of understanding and unmasking the secularist conspiracy against religion and traditions in Saudi Kingdom and restore the role of Islam and Ulama in society. This is why. Al Roma defined Fit al Wakya in mainly in political terms as a science making it possible to understand current situations, notably the factors acting on societies, the forces dominating states, the ideas designed to undermine faith, and the legitimate, legitimate means of protecting the Oma and making it in France now and in the future. Uh, for Oma, Fit al Wakya represent one of the three pillars on which every factor is based. Fit al Usul, just the of the principles, Fit al Furo, Sufan the Law, and Fit al Wakya. So these are the three principles. Unlike the worldly sciences, I will give you the real, Fit al Wakya is for him a Shariatic science, a equipped with the necessary principles and complements from which it emerged, from which it emerged and proceeds. Therefore, for him, Fitr al is a real scientific knowledge, is a ilm, rather than subjective art. It's not a fact, it's an ilm. And constitutes an individual obligation, is far behind, for every scholar and student of knowledge. For Roma, the fundamentals of legitimacy of Fitr al resides in the Quranic objective of exposing to the, to the believers the way of the sinners, of which we know, the way of the sinners, of criminals, or of the Bible. How it is sometimes in different ways. And so the Quran, one of the objectives of the Quran is to expose the believers, the ways of the sinners against them. And this is the legitimacy of the Quran, and the main source. Uh, and to warn them against their thoughts. Right? And it mentions the Quran, uh, Surah 6, verse 14. Uh, for him, for a Roman, understanding the ways of the sinners requires knowledge of the, uh, a detailed knowledge of the methodologies used by them. In their thoughts against Allah. In Omar's view, the establishment of Fit al Wakya requires erudition from the Ulama and the ability to navigate a vast array of sources from the Islamic ones to the more contemporary ones. He strongly argues that in order to acquire a correct perception of the reality and establish the right Sharia ruling on it, uh, Ulama should have a bigger disciplinary. Training and be in touch with work on political science, diplomacy, political economy, international relations, maybe India, history, etc. They must become an important influencing factor in society by developing a positive interaction with reality and by immersing themselves in everyday life because, as he expresses it, it is not just a moment, it is no exaggeration if I say, indeed, whoever stops following. The event for six months needs a long period before being able to get back in touch with the elements. In the particular Saudi context, Saudi context, uh, 
this means that unlike, unlike political parties of the Wahhabi establishment, fiddle warfare requires from other schools to lead the call for social political reform and change. Uh, in Omar's view, the various similar disciplines that are fundamental for proper understanding and construction of fiddle warfare needs to have a shayati grounding, tahsil shari, tahsil shari. He argues that the empirical and positivist methods used by secularists to understand reality, so they take into consideration all the materialist factors, are both insufficient and deficient, and lead to the misrepresentation of reality. Only how a, a, a holistic understanding of social and religious reality under the transcendent and universal shayati principles can yield certain can bring certainty. Therefore, Sahu scholars, or Sahu ulama, or Sahu intellectuals, are the only category that can legitimately establish the truth of a specific reality. Because they can combine both ulama bimaniya or ulama sharia. I mean, they grant social sciences in sharia. This conceptual move allows Oma to accomplish a dual purpose. One, it enables him to derive modern intellectual or big principles monopoly over the establishing nature of social political reality. On the other hand, it allows him to challenge the monopoly of the traditional ulama over religious matters by presenting Sahu scholars who practice Fitnah Wakya as saviors of the religious field. Uh, and by crafting for us an intellectual and conceptual space in which they can provide learned religious opinions of different social and cultural reality of the economic conflict. For Omar, the Saudi ulama, the Saudi Senate ulama, are guilty of ignoring fiddle warfare in their religious methodology and consequently of being opinions on surrounding social political reality and produce fatwas that do not correspond to the reality. Only by obtaining the necessary expertise in these fields, that you mentioned, and possesses an interdisciplinary training, master scholars will be able to apply the correct perception and establish the right Sharia law. So this was pretty much the, let's say, the position of the Sahis towards Fitul Wakya and the way they, they mobilized it against modernists and against the religious field. Now, throughout the 80s and especially the 90s, uh, the, the Fitul Wakya was a great debate in, within Saudi social life and especially the religious field. And uh, non Sahmi Salafi scholars engaged with that, although in an apologetic way, the Sahmi scholars are very apologetic in their own construction, they engaged with them, trying to understand or criticize the preservation of Fikr Wakya uh, represented by the Sahmi's themselves. Usually, this part, the Salafi reply of Fikr Wakya, is almost absent in, in the modern literature of Western literature of the Sahmi's. And uh, because it is presupposed, I think, by many scholars that the Salafi, the most Sahmi Salafi reply are just some people who want to preserve the status quo. And they just reply through, through their own literalism, but they do not constitute any valuable source of analysis to understand or to bring something new. And it is my contention that actually if you see and study the books or the articles of the fatwas, issued by the non-Sahri Salafi scholars and the criticism of the fiddle work presented by the Sahri, you will see that they have actually offered a reason for criticism. And the criticism is not just it is not just, literal, uh, it's not just based on literalist considerations, but it's also involves Akhir and Hitler and I don't know, pragmatism and so on, and also a kind of intuition of political and social realities of Saudi Arabia. So the, the, the last part of my speech will be actually a kind of synthesis of what discursive strategies used the non Sahri Salafi scholars to reply to the Sahris and to try to bring them back to the Salafi lineage, or even try to actually exclude them from the Salafi lineage. So, uh, I'll start with the first. So, the first one of the strategy used by the East. Actually, that of discrediting the origin and the legitimacy of the notion of fiddle work. So, uh, for example, in, in, in his word by word refutation of the Omar's treaties, Saud al Mukaymi, 
construct a genealogy of fecal water in which the notion is traced back to Western literary and political realism and more academia. In this view, the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood appropriated realism from the Arab secularist literary scholars and political circles and passed it down to the Sahras. Such a genealogy of fecal water serves a double purpose. For one hand, it relegates to the one of the literary modernism, but in the South context is represented by secularist and modernist intellectual. And from the other hand, it traces its origin, its religious origin back to the past brotherhood, discrediting in this way Sahrawi religious conventions in front of this Wahhabi Salafi audience. Whereas Sonia Abdul Aziz Al Sheikh, the great Salafi scholar, traced the origin of the notion of fickle water to see Kudus. Commentary of Surah Yusuf, verse 55, in which Yusuf once uh, interprets a dream in front of the, of the king, is asked what kids he wants or something like that. And he actually asked him to be uh, his minister of justice or something or treasury or yeah. uh, So, Sali uh, Abdul Aziz al Shaykh said the Fitul Wakya, the pedigree of Fitul Wakya, it turns back to say, it's not from the pile of sellers. Uh, because he put in this commentary of this particular verse, divides Islamic jurisprudence into two categories Fikr al Orak and Fikr al Haraka. So, jurisprudence of texts, or people texts, and the jurisprudence of movements. Fikr al Haraka, the second one, is based on Fikr al Wakya, according to Putin, uh, and consists in the attempt to establish an idea of Islamic society where people are willing to submit to their sovereignty. For him, the establishment of the Islamic state is a precondition for the existence and the establishment of the jurisprudence of text in the law. Wahhabi scholars categorically reject Kut's perspective and attribute it to the Sahabis in order to highlight what they perceive as the inherent problems of the Saudi discourse. That is, keeping the fact of precedence of Fikr al over the jurisprudence of text. Because the text of Kutub says that. Fikr Haraka is a movement based on Fikr Wakya being established for the Islamic State. And then the Ulum and Fikr will be elaborated in the right context. Now, the Wahhabi scholars use this as the original Fikr Wakya and refuse it by saying that this is not a knowledge of faith because it was the fact that he is left for a second stage. So Fikr Wakya is outside actually the real being. Uh, so this was the first, like, Discrediting the original legitimacy of the notion of Fikr Wakya. The second is questioning the epistemological validity of Fikr Wakya sources. Uh, again, Sadi Abdul Aziz Al Sheikh says that the sources mentioned by, by subjects like media, politics, history, I don't know, etc., etc., are uh, and we form an Arwani, are sources that are Arwani and lack of the necessary epistemological certainty of the thing. Objectivity or boundaries, the limits, right, to be considered ideal. As he explains, and I quote, the knowledge of the political reality is information through the news, is right, and not that is not understanding of the truth, it's just being informed by, 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 some, by some news, right? And the point. For some of you, another senior scholar, senior scholar. The knowledge of contemporary political reality should be considered a kind of tasawr in a kind of imagination or perception of reality, and not fit in a not understanding of the reality. And normally, tasawr is used to refer to actually get to the bottom of, the, of something, right? Uh, or something true. Here, tasawr, by him, is used just kind of the 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 kind of Essence or something. Uh, then, Sali Al Fozan also, no, Sali Al Fozan, another senior scholar, contends that significant politics and media are based on estimation, speculation, and personal subjectivity. Therefore, in Iran, the fiscal work is the follow of Hama, the following of individual passions, but evil passions, not bad ones, good ones. Another Salafi scholar of Arabia, Makhari, Questions the neutrality of the sources of the world. In his opinion, media and politics, this is from a book that he says in 
It is okay the media and politics and this some we rely uh, originate from non Muslim sources. And the enemies of Islam who have vested interest in misleading Muslims. Therefore, they cannot be considered reliable sources. And he actually replied back to the Sahris because the Sahris themselves based their idea of the right on a conflict or on a conspiracy, right? Or the modernists. And he said, okay, you are replying to the conspiracy by understanding what the, the plots are, but you are using sources that come from them. Therefore, by your own logic, your sources are not reliable. Uh, Nasruddin al Bani, uh, again, my dear scholar and uh, fun by the series, uh, uh, contends that the Sahri request, and this is a quotation actually, the Sahri request for the combination of Fit and and Fit the Tabasun in the single person is impossible in Utopia. In this regard, he says, Sahri discourse obliged the scholars of the book and Sunna to be knowledgeable also in economics, social science, politics, and the regime. Methods of using modern weapons, etc. I do not think that there exists any rational person who thinks that a single person can govern in himself all of these various sciences. Uh, therefore, this was part of the, of the question of epistemology. And the third discursive strategy was actually the question of the lack of new time approach to reality. As I said, one of the main contributions of Sahis was actually saying that. Uh, uh, the, the, the social field of Saudi Arabia is, is sect sectorized and their sectors. They do not integrate with each other except they have a political relationship with a political field that they obey or not obey to the from the context. And this is a kind of is a process is a result of the process of modernization and is a, a fragmentation of social life. Therefore, modernists are becoming relevant in the modern part of Saudi Arabia because this reflects a secularist approach towards reality when religion is uh, separated from the public sphere and each has its own so, so, reality when it operates. Therefore, through the Tawhid al-Hakimiya and through Fiqh al-Wadi, we should integrate reality and reflect it in social fields so that the Tawhid makes its own unitary approach towards reality or integrated approach for the time. Now, some Salafi scholars have actually argued that the fiqh al of the Sahmis undoes what it claims to do, which means fragmentarizes the reality that is already unified. So uh, this line of, of reply goes like this, that uh, they have argued, for example, that the division that the Sahmis do of ulama al as and ulama al waqi scholars of the texts, literally scholars, and scholars of the waqi or ulama al-shara and ulama al-waqi, scholars of law or of the sharia and scholars of the reality, in fact, corresponds to the Sufi antinomian conference between sharia and hadiqa, sharia and reality. Uh, for Madhali, for example, <coughs> uh, sharia, according to the Sahwis, is perceived as an outward dimension of faith, textual, scriptural, ulama, this is represented by this thing. Whereas reality and hakika and wakia is the inward, the core of the truth, of religious truth and social truth. Therefore, it's the inward aspect. And this is Sahwi Muyama who represents that. And this, if you go through the Antigonian Sufism, it represents Sharia Uyama and the Wahhabis, Otwar Uyama and the Inward Uyama of Sahis. Consequently, the inward ulama are superior to the works of Otto as well. Therefore, the Sahri ulama are superior to the, to the scholar of Shemiyah. Another uh, other scholar and pupil, Masraddin Adani, Ali al Hadidi, he concurs, he agrees with Madhali, and portrays the Sahri approach to Peter Wattes, he calls it a Tasawwuf and Asri, modern Sufism. And contends the Sahri and phenomenon tendency parallels the modernist Western technology. Of progressive versus reaction. So progressive are all in the mind of Wakya and the reaction are in the mind of text. Uh, where progress is equal to the knowledge of the Wakya and the reaction to the knowledge of the spiritual deity. Now what they are saying here is that is that in reality you are claiming to bring a unitarian integrative approach to the religious discourse, 
and do the social criticism. But in reality, you are actually fragmentizing, fragmentizing the religious discourse by putting this antinomious binary uh, analysis in which certain scholars are considered superficial, certainly more uh, deep, and certain as a representative of truth, and certain of just a representative of the definition. And this is the same problem that Sufis had, and this is why we have refused that apology to Salafi. And we are just repeating the same problem. The last one, the fourth discursive strategy, is actually questioning the status, the status, the religious status, and the obligatoriness of Tukhan work. Now, as I said, scholars of Tukhan work are presenting Tukhan work as far behind. For every scholar, and Student of knowledge. Uh, now, some scholars, some Senate scholars, uh, also many Senate scholars actually, what they have done is that they haven't rejected the work, they have actually accepted it. But they have downgraded its religious status to far defined and not, and not far right. So the community, uh, or the communal obligation, not the individual obligation. Uh, Fitalwari in this context is just a supplementary aspect of Fitalwari of, of, of the fit of Kitab and Sunnah. It's not, it's not an essential factor of it. It's just a supplementary knowledge. Uh, for example, Nasrani al Bani, uh, in his book, Suwari al Jawad and Fitalwari, he accepts Fitalwari and he, he also gives a, a definition very similar to the Nasrani when he put it in terms. The Fitalwari is important for us to know what we are talking about. Us and to make us grow in a more relevant society, etc. But he says that Twitter one is just fun to fight. And this is the problem, the problem in the state of Islamism. It's like the Twitter Luga, Twitter Sola Kyomia, or Twitter Khila. All these disciplines are hard to fight for people. Uh, and there is the rule in Islamic law that you cannot impose hard to fight to everybody. It is obligatory only on people who have to take the burden of fulfilling it and not to everybody. While the Sahmis are doing obligatory on everybody and then losing the proportions of how this legitimate tool should be applied. He says, Albani, uh, that uh, that uh, the transformation of Fikr Waka by the Sahmis in a manage for Islamic power. He is a manifest error and a great mistake. Uh, for him, the fulfillment of the water belongs, and I quote, to the rulers who have the power to order and execute, and not to the enthusiastic preachers and speculative journalists. End of quote. So here, he actually delegates the fact of this this fitted water to the rulers. Or to the think tanks of the state, or to the ministries, or to whatever they call it. And he's doing exactly what the Psalms were criticizing, uh, claiming ownership of a specific reality to specific social fields, saying, you know, this part of reality, political, social, history, is left to, to uh, state, ministries, I don't know, think tanks, or this thing. Then in the Sami context, we're all mostly. Ruled by modern institutions. Therefore, for Sahib, that was a problem. For Albani, this is a normal way out of which we On the same line, Othini presents Fit and Wadia, Fit and D, as a mutually exclusive. For him, the preoccupation of Fit and Wadia prevents the uh, practitioner of Fit and D from acquiring knowledge in faith. Because the heart, he says, and uh, God is a vessel. That if he can do something, prevent the presence of something else. So here, what he means is actually building the binary or antinomial approach where Fikr Deen and Fikr Iwaka is, is all separated together, uh, separated from each other, and mutually exclusive. It's interesting that the Sahmis have actually pushed uh, the Salafi scholars to, to come with divisions of fit, different effects. They didn't have them before, you know, Fikr Deen or Fikr Discipline. But they are doing that in order to require the Sahis. For him, for all of you, there are only two things. You know, that uh, every believer should be is found on and everybody. And that's Fit and Mess, which for him is actually achieving the right of Judah. 
and if we saw it hot. And the second is fit and better. That for him consists in the knowing what is halal and what is halal and preserving your body from committing sins. What lies outside this is for him just to find if I is just for me not duty. Therefore, it should be left to specialists, which is how the context I mentioned. Probably more than this, and to the government of Paris. Uh, Abdul Aziz Ali Sheikh also says that you uh, saw so most of the same, on the same line. He argues that uh, he's, a, he's a father of fire and it should not be applied to people, it should not be made in common. He says that Wakia that is far I first call it, is just the Wakia that is relevant for the issue that scholars have at hand. If an issue comes to Wakabi, a woman and a man are divorcing, the Qadi is obliged to know the circumstantial reality of that particular case. It's an individual obligation for him to know that. And only after that he will fatwa. But to oblige the Qadi to know the reality of everything that goes around and everything that happens in society or to the grasp with the that ethnicity or social field is going outside the fitting what he requires and for him. So uh, the, the downplaying of the right of the communal obligation represents a conceptual cautious move by the non Sahib service only to derive the Sahib discourse from the Tetanwaka, from its power and efficacy, and uh, as it is applies against the Wahhabi establishment. This allow this is my conclusion. So, this Saudi Salafi compartmentalized view of the reality reflects actually. The Saudi sectorization of the social space, where the religious and the political field inhabit and are responsible for different and separate uh, social fields. Here we are confronted with two different articulations of religion in Saudi Arabia. On one side are the Sahabs, who based on the framework of Tawhid and Hakimiyah, present an integrative view of reality and conceptualize Hidden as a constitutive element. An inherent part of what is traditionally known as fit and deed. Therefore, it is an individual duty for every school. On the other side are the traditional non Sahri Salafi scholars, who, in accordance with the sectorization of Saudi social fields, they have actually so defined religion as a notion, they have refined religion as a notion and, and have confined it to a specific, specific social space or intellectual realm. And have conceptualized fit and what as external to what is properly considered the fit, fit the. Therefore, it's a political implication. Now, the entire emergence of the discourse of fit and what is, as we saw, inextricably connected with modernity and with the new social political reality that is created in South Korea. The Sahis themselves were a product of attentions. And social disruptions created by the rapid modernization of the South Kingdom, and the emergence of, of entire new social fields or spaces inhabited and claimed by the new actors. The Hidden Facility debate on the epistemological and religious validity of the new media, uh, uh, media technologies or the contemporary sources like the history of politics that have characterized the debate. Is unintelligible outside the modernization process and the new conditions that it created in Saudi Arabia. The same is true of the contrasting views between Sahmiris and other non Saudi trends on the nature of reality. Islamic politics and the nature of reality, Islamic politics and its role in Islamic life. The debate of Fikir Wat is an indicator of the struggle of various contemporary Saudi groups to articulate a credible and relevant religious discourse. Within the new conditions and sensibilities enabled by the modernization process in South Korea. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, for any section, any question? Well, there's a lot to discuss here. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Uh, rest and the different trends within that, that school. 
the way I would characterize the, uh, the Saudi intelligentsia, uh, political intelligentsia, and scholars, I would put them mainly in four categories. The first category would be those who learn the sciences and they don't want to be associated. I have a big one. Yeah. No, no, I'm going to do it. Just a little bit. I wrote it on paper. This is really good. Okay. Okay. Um, so I would characterize that we have the first category, in which I would put them that those who learn religious sciences interested in religious education, they are not interested to establish any kind of relationship with the state, and therefore they want to be away from the pressure of the state. The second category is uh, those who have learned religious sciences, and they have decided that not only they don't want to be part of the state, but they want to fight the state. This culminated in 1979 with uh, China. And then uh, the other phase of it came in 1999 with the Latin American strike. The third and fourth, they, 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 they have the same background, but one has decided consciously to tie itself to the state. So many of these scholars, the way I'm, the way, the reason I'm doing this is to show another level that I would like to talk about and to include in your presentation. And that's many of these uh, positions, and many of these fatwas, and many of these uh, movements. It's very much tied to the, to the, to the Saudi state. We don't. There are those who are basically uh, manifestation of Saudi uh, foreign policy or Saudi domestic policy. And those who have decided that they don't want to support it, but they don't want to uh, be the same as a fire. fire. So how to, to, to maneuver this becomes a struggle. So those like Safar Hawali, you know, Salman al and so on, and all these people who come under this category, and maybe that the last one, Safar Hawali, actually gives us a good uh, presentation or a good uh, overview of what they stand for. So the political aspect is very much part of this. And I would like to see more discussion along these lines and how they are tied. And of course, the background also that there is a great struggle obviously with the Saudi royal family is to establish the religious and they have started all kinds of different religious institutions and different and scholars to give them that legitimacy that they have been threatened with now they have been threatened by basically two forces obviously Iran since 1971 that came and the Islamic revolution Islamic reform and at, at one point, it presented a, a real uh, challenge until obviously this, this rise of sectarianism has, has probably put this threat a little bit. And the second major threat came with the not only with Muslim Brotherhood and Islamic movements and what happened in Turkey, but this whole debate about the role of the people in making decisions, okay. democracy, rule of law. Uh, Arab Springs obviously was a great, great challenge, and that's why they, they mobilized all their sources and became so clear now who is on which side. And that's what actually these people, you know, basically they tried to represent that without going and challenging directly the, uh, the, uh, the, the rulers. So when we talk about fiqh and waqa, you're basically talking about how to adapt modern political, social, and economic problems into this. Uh, to build the paradigm into this kind of dynamics so that you can say that this is where I stand in terms of Islam, Islam. And obviously this is not new. I mean, it's not about uh, This is every Islamic movement that wanted to reform and they were seeking political change. They had to deal with this in a way that they would be, uh, uh, for the most part, uh, criticized by those who claim that they have the, 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 the Higher ground, and you know, oh, this is nonsense. This is, you know, Gaia, and this is, this is not real science. This is, this is something that others, you know, so they try to, uh, to, to, to uh, downplay or downgrade this so that they can justify the, 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 uh, the, the existing. So, this is just a, a small recommendation. Um, so, what I would like to say again, the other thing is what is, what are the basic, what are the basic characteristics 
from those, you know, so if, if, if you were writing a dissertation on this, I would have a chapter in which I would give the redistribution between these two, three different classes. Right. You know, what are their main goal? What, what are these people trying to solve? Are they trying to overturn? You know, the letter was very clear. We want to get rid of the royal family. What, what is the goal of these people? Is it just slow reform so that eventually they get to what exactly? That is not very well articulated. Even with their ruling body. I'm talking about what the I mean, it's very clear that they don't like that status quo, but it's not really clear is what they want. Perhaps they can't articulate it very well because of political pressures. Uh, unlike, for instance, those who are in London, Saad al Faqih and Al Mas'ali, in which they say exactly what they want. I mean, those who are in Saudi Arabia, what can I say? So that I think this will also be integrated into. And then the question about mass movements and elites. This whole thing is really part of the elite. I'm not sure at all that somebody like um, you know Salman al Oda, who has maybe I don't know, 20 million followers or something, that this is represents a movement. It doesn't. I mean, these are all people who, who it's like celebrities to me more than the Sahwis. The Sahwis. Yes, I you know more than mass movement. So this this stays at an elite level to, for me. You know, as an observer, as a, as some, as a person who, who studies this movement, it's not clear that they have any path towards social mobilization. Right. So in that case, their efficacy, I mean, I know, I know a lot of the West are very interested and fascinated by these phenomena. But unless it turns into a social movement for change, it's going to stay at that level, the level of elites. Maybe it's not that good because it gives you some kind of, of new thinking, but it doesn't uh, help much with, with social uh, change. So uh, I believe that the last book by the uh, Sifr al Hawali yes. is like a manifesto. I think he thought that this was his last book. Right. This is my receiving. Yes, exactly. Exactly. But, it, uh, yeah, but that's great. But how that's going to go in from being the manifesto right. to something on the ground, I think, is, is, is much lacking. If I may make the last yes. point. Um, is that part of your description of these different groups, then we have to have a, a more understanding of what is the goal of this group, what are the methodologies, how do you think they can come to what are the major differences also, which is basically a comparative study between this group and the other groups and their political roles as well as their relationship to the uh, Saudi royal family and the overall geopolitical situation in, 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 in the Middle East and the other world. I think all of these are interrelated. It's, it's like uh, an entire life coming. Yeah, no, no, but, but it's important that it's mentioned yeah, because absolutely. that dimension, if it's not mentioned, it doesn't give you the full absolutely. understanding of what's going on. My, my interest, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, think about uh, My interest is on Fikri Wahda. It's not Fikri so I'm interested in the work in the 70s per se. It's like the articulation of the work in contemporary Islam. In the sense, I like to, this is something that I've been trying to do, but then the thesis takes get more shape. It's like, uh, what did it start all this together? I think the Fikr work from the 50s with the Qadawi and, and up, then the Sahu's 80s, the 90s, then now you have. Uh, Abdullah bin Bayya and the neo traditionalists using it. Uh, and, uh, but this is, do you think Abdullah bin Bayya's uh, use of this is because this is really what he believes in, or this has been directed politically? Well, so, that, so that's, that's the point. So uh, there is no escape from the politics of Fikr al Fikr al is pretty much you know, counted on. Pragmatic political even ideologies. So that's that's true, but how do you articulate it religiously? And how do so from uh, so I start I, I started with Kandao in the fifties and it's already focused this kind of Mahali and Islamity and the replies to the modernization of Egypt and to the secularism of the time and the that they have. And then and then how he, he goes to work and how in the 80s with this uh, awakening between extremism and this and the articulation of the in the political context with the 
with Jenny's groups that came out of the, of the, of the movement and how we uh, and how we interpreted them and how we, uh, how we constructed Sahara, Sahara, their Sahara in a way that is like fits with politics and stuff. And then uh, in the nineties or so you have so there are many developments within now in company, there are many developments in science, and this is not how we want to be real. What I want to, uh, in my thesis, I want to pay attention to the, uh, without losing touch with politics, that's not good touch. If you don't explain with this, you will not get why actually they are speaking about this, why, what is this division, what are these replies, that's absolutely true. But I will first of all want to know how do they articulate it religiously? How do they establish it? What are the legal mechanisms that they walk mobilize for, for making it a legitimate tool of religious discourse or even religious reform? What is the reality in their view of this? I'll try to do some comparative also. But what is reality? What kind of theory of reality do they expose in the understanding of the law? Of a one is a realist, subjectivist, in the in the philosophical debate, where can we situate past the scholars, especially people of heart, in the understanding of reality, what kind of theory? And then the politics of freedom. How does this discourse situate in the politics in which they were living and the project that they wanted to establish? Because I will be some, I will try to pay attention to the um, political dimension in order to highlight, to make sense of all the political of all the discourse and why they have done. In this, in this speech part, I, I just first of all want to put to in the debate also the other part, not just the suffrages, because usually in the literature are the suffrages and how they work. But now, we don't take too much attention to the other. To the other. Have you noticed that most of the, uh, when I trace it back, mm -hmm. that they would find that these people were influenced for the large part of the Sanitarian movements in Europe? Absolutely. And they have basically adopted much of their tools and, and even discourse and language, and how they approach this. And that's why now they are probably being tied. Some of them actually were members at one point or another, maybe for a few years and they left, but they had the same mentality. So that's different from a mentality of a uh, someone who's maybe a fiduciary, or someone who's using to go and you know, blame another for saying or another for saying or something. But I, I think that intellectual uh, line, so to speak, how to approach the 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 person in charge. I, I think when you when you present it as a soccer per se, it's part of the overall regional soccer, so it's so separate. And but it, it, what, what happens with Saudi is actually their effect, and I think that's another probably a dimension. Their effect on the Muslim Brotherhood is as much as the political the effect of Muslim Brotherhood left. So you start to see in the Senators in Egypt, in different places, in Jordan, from the Palestinians, more Salafi thinking than it was before. That's true. So that is also, which is not healthy, by the way. For the most part, this was a detrimental effect on many of their thinking and how they, and how they uh, reacted to society and others. They, they were seen, instead of being more of a movement that can embrace most of the people in the state, it became more, again, more uh, elitist, more uh, traditional, more conservative, more conservative. Uh, so that's that. That was not a. Uh, but I, I want to know. You know, my question here is: um, you stated your conclusion, obviously. So, what would be your uh, overall assessment of this Sahara? What you call Sahara is uh, in Saudi Arabia, or is it more so of the region? This was in Saudi Arabia. Yes. The Saudi region, but then. For this speech was in Saudi Arabia because even the scholars who reply. But your dissertation is also uh, centered on Saudi Arabia or in Saudi Arabia? So my, my dissertation would be 
the great talk will be still working on the device and I don't know, plan to uh, I'll try to concentrate on three, let's say, moments or three articulations. One is the Kandawi and this entire writing corpus from the 50s to the 90s, mostly. Because after that, figure one didn't develop too much, just pretty much the same. And how it interacted, how it was established discursively, what discourse of figure one, how what was the politics of figure one? against the state, against the Jewish groups of that time, etc. Then the second walk, the second let's say moment is the Sahis 1890s, Sanabal, Sibatanabia, and Nazi Roma. And also the same thing, how they established the Kurimata and what was the purpose and what was the religious justification and political context in which they came. And what was the debate? What can we learn from the debate that had to do groups? What can we understand? And then the fickle one, the first kind of level moment with big data and, and company. Mm -hmm. Because they also have replied to a specific moment in the entire thing. And it would be interesting to see, they never, as far as I said, they never refer to each other. Despite they using very similar. So you concentrate on something because these. You know, I am part of the back of the day. Right, right. And the, the two most important uh, figures mm -hmm. were none of these mm -hmm. in terms of the law. Okay. Aside from say photo because said photo basically introduced something, was not part of the debate. He, he came to it. But the two most important people is probably the okay. So when it comes to these kind of things, okay. and, and then these people always responded to them rather than produce these. Yes. Some some knowledge, you know, whether it's about democracy issues or about yes. women, about about you know, all kinds of issues that that was uh, facing China Islamic movement. So perhaps yours is, is more geared towards the Salafi. But I, I wouldn't put Kaldawi in that category. So you need to distinguish it why you're not using or talking about Torabi and Manushi and the, the different controversies. So as well as you know Mukawa and resistance. What happened in Palestine then also? Right. So probably uh I I mentioned the only so-called internal critics, right? Because because you have to tell one in modernist revisionist political form and that's the same thing. Right, right, right. I'll be more interested in the in the kind of figure one that emerge within within the the kind of internal criticism of the tradition, right? No, I just don't want people to criticize you that you have missed people. So you know, say, absolutely, absolutely. You know, I'm talking about this region and these people and this kind of thing. Most, most, you know, all of that. Maybe you know, after this, you go to the other side. I'm done. I'm done. Let's take it out. 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 let Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us.